Section 18 of Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 4, Chapter 13. You will observe one curious trait, said Sidonia to Coningsby, in the history of this country. The depository of power is always unpopular. All combine against it, it always falls. Power was deposited in the great barons. The church, using the king for its instrument, crushed the great barons. Power was deposited in the church. The king, bribing the parliament, plundered the church. Power was deposited in the king. The parliament, using the people, beheaded the king, expelled the king, changed the king, and finally, for a king, substituted an administrative officer. For one hundred and fifty years, power has been deposited in the parliament and for the last sixty or seventy years it has been becoming more and more unpopular in eighteen thirty it was endeavoured by a reconstruction to regain the popular affection but in truth as the parliament then only made itself more powerful it has only become more odious and we see that the barons the church the king have in turn devoured each other and that the parliament the last devourer remains it is impossible to resist the impression that this body also is doomed to be destroyed and he is a sagacious statesman who may detect in what form and in what quarter the great consumer will arise you take then a dark view of our position troubled not dark i do not ascribe to political institutions that paramount influence which it is the feeling of this age to attribute to them the senate that confronted brennus in the forum was the same body that registered in an after age the ribald decrees of a nero trial by jury for example is looked upon by all as the palladium of our liberties yet a jury at a very recent period of our own history the reign of charles the second was a tribunal as iniquitous as the inquisition and a graver expression stole over the countenance of sidonia as he remembered what the inquisition had operated on his own race and his own destiny there are families in this country he continued of both the great historical parties that in the persecution of their houses the murder and prescription of some of their most illustrious members found judges as unjust and relentless in an open jury of their countrymen as we did in the conclaves of madrid and seville where then would you look for hope in what is more powerful than laws and institutions and without which the best laws and the most skilful institutions may be a dead letter or the very means of tyranny in the national character it is not in the increased feebleness of its institutions that i see the peril of england it is in the decline of its character as a community and yet you could scarcely describe this age as an age of corruption not of political corruption but it is an age of social disorganization far more dangerous in its consequences because far more extensive you may have a corrupt government and a pure community you may have a corrupt community and a pure administration which would you elect neither said coningsby i wish to see a people full of faith and a government full of duty rely upon it said sidonia that england should think more of the community and less of the government but tell me what do you understand by the term national character a character is an assemblage of qualities the character of england should be an assemblage of great qualities but we cannot deny that the english have great virtues the civilization of a thousand years must produce great virtues but we are speaking of the decline of public virtue not its existence in what then do you trace that decline in the fact that the various classes of this country are arrayed against each other but to what do you attribute those reciprocal hostilities not entirely not even principally to those economical causes of which we hear so much i look upon all such as secondary causes which in a certain degree must always exist which obtrude themselves in troubled times and which at all times it is the business of the wise statesman to watch to regulate to ameliorate to modify 
"'I am speaking to elicit truth, not to maintain opinion,' said Coningsby, "'for I have none,' he added mournfully. "'I think,' said Sidonia, "'that there is no error so vulgar as to believe that revolutions are occasioned by economical causes. They come in, doubtless, very often to precipitate a catastrophe. Very rarely do they occasion one. I know no period, for example, when physical comfort was more diffused in England than in 1640. England had a moderate population, a very improved agriculture, a rich commerce, yet she was on the eve of the greatest and most violent changes that she has yet experienced. That was a religious movement. Admit it, the cause, then, was not physical. The imagination of England rose against the government. It proves, then, that when that faculty is astir in a nation, it will sacrifice even physical comfort to follow its impulses. Do you think, then, there is a wild desire for extensive political change in the country? Hardly that. England is perplexed at the present moment, not inventive. That will be the next phasis in her moral state, and to that I wish to draw your thoughts. For myself, while I ascribe little influence to physical causes for the production of this perplexity, I am still less of opinion that it can be removed by any new dispensation of political power. It would only aggravate the evil. That would be recurring to the old era of supposing you can necessarily find national content in political institutions. A political institution is a machine. The motive power is the national character. With that it rests whether the machine will benefit society or destroy it. Society in this country is perplexed, almost paralyzed. In time it will move and it will devise. How are the elements of the nation to be again blended together? In what spirit is that reorganization to take place? To know that would be to know everything. At least let us free ourselves from the double ignorance of the Platonists. Let us not be ignorant that we are ignorant. I have emancipated myself from that darkness for a long time, said Coningsby. Long has my mind been musing over these thoughts, but to me all is still obscurity. In this country, said Sidonia, since the peace there has been an attempt to advocate a reconstruction of society on a purely rational basis. The principle of utility has been powerfully developed. I speak not with lightness of the labours of the disciples of that school. I bow to intellect in every form, and we should be grateful to any school of philosophers, even if we disagree with them. Doubly grateful in this country, where for so long a period our statesmen were in so pitiable an arrear of public intelligence. There has been an attempt to reconstruct society on a basis of material motives and calculations. It has failed. It must ultimately have failed under any circumstances. Its failure in an ancient and densely peopled kingdom was inevitable. How limited is human reason, the profoundest inquirers are most conscious. We are not indebted to the reason of man for any of the great achievements which are the landmarks of human action and human progress. It was not reason that besieged Troy. It was not reason that sent forth the Saracen from the desert to conquer the world, that inspired the Crusaders, that instituted the monastic orders. It was not reason that produced the Jesuits. Above all, it was not reason that created the French Revolution. Man is only truly great when he acts from the passions, never irresistible, but when he appeals to the imagination. Even Mormon counts more votaries than Bentham. And you think, then, that as imagination once subdued the state, imagination may now save it? Man is made to adore and to obey, but if you will not command him, if you give him nothing to worship, he will fashion his own divinities and find a chieftain in his own passions. But where can we find faith in a nation of sectaries? Who can feel loyalty to a sovereign of Downing Street? I speak of the eternal principles of human nature. You answer me with the passing accidents of the hour. Sects rise and sects disappear. Where are the fifth monarchy men? England is governed by Downing Street. Once it was governed by Alfred and Elizabeth. End of chapter 13 Book 4, Chapter 14 
About this time a steeplechase in the west of England had attracted considerable attention. This sport was then of recent introduction in England, and is in fact an importation of Irish growth, although it has flourished in our soil. A young guardsman, who was then a guest at the castle, and who had been in a garrison in Ireland, had some experience of this pastime in the Kildare country, and he proposed that they should have a steeplechase at Coningsby. This was a suggestion very agreeable to the Marquis of Beaumanoir, celebrated for his feats of horsemanship, and indeed to most of the guests. It was agreed that the race should come off at once, before any of the present company, many of whom gave symptoms of being on the wing, had quitted the castle. The young guardsman and Mr. Guy Flouncey had surveyed the country, and had selected a line which they esteemed very appropriate for the scene of action. From a hill of common land you looked down upon the valley of Coningsby, richly cultivated, deeply ditched, and stiffly fenced. The valley was bounded by another rising ground, and the scene was admirably calculated to give an extensive view to a multitude. The distance along the valley was to be two miles out and home again, the starting post being also the winning post, and the flags which were placed on every fence which the horses were to pass, were to be passed on the left hand of the rider, both going and coming, so that although the horses had to leap the same fences forward and backward, they could not come over the same place twice. In the last field, before they turned, was a brook seventeen feet clear from side to side, with good taking off both banks. Here real business commenced. Lord Monmouth highly approved the scheme, but mentioned that the stakes must be moderate and open to the whole county. The neighbourhood had a week of preparation, and the entries for the Coningsby steeplechase were numerous. Lord Monmouth, after a reserve for his own account, placed his stable at the service of his guests. For himself, he offered to back his horse, Sir Robert, which was to be ridden by his grandson. Now, nothing was spoken of or thought of at Coningsby Castle except the coming sport. The ladies shared the general excitement. They embroidered handkerchiefs and scarfs and gloves with the respective colours of the rivals and tried to make jockey caps. Lady St. Julian's postponed her intended departure in consequence. Madame Colonna wished that some means could be contrived by which they might all win. Sidonia, with the other competitors, had ridden over the ground and glanced at the brook with the eye of a workman. On his return to the castle, he sent a dispatch for some of his stud. Coningsby was all anxiety to win. He was proud of the confidence of his grandfather in backing him. He had a powerful horse and a first-rate fencer, and he was resolved himself not to flinch. On the night before the race, retiring somewhat earlier than usual to his chamber, he observed on his dressing-table a small packet addressed to his name and in an unknown handwriting. Opening it, he found a pretty racing jacket embroidered with his colours of pink and white. This was a perplexing circumstance, but he fancied it on the whole a happy omen. And who was the donor? Certainly not the Princess Lucretia, for he had observed her fashioning some maroon ribbons which were the colours of Sidonia. It could scarcely be from Mrs. Guy Flouncey. Perhaps Madame Colonna to please the Marquis? Thinking over this incident, he fell asleep. The morning before the race, Sidonia's horses arrived. All went to examine them at the stables. Among them was an Arab mare. Coningsby recognised the daughter of the star. She was greatly admired for her points, but Guy Flouncey whispered to Mr. Melton that she could never do the work. "'But Lord Beaumanoir says he is all for speed and against strength in these affairs,' said Mr. Melton. Guy Flouncey smiled incredulously. The night before the race it rained rather heavily. "'I take it the country will not be very like the deserts of Arabia,' said Mr. Guy Flouncey, with a knowing look to Mr. Melton, who was noting a bet in his memorandum book. The morning was fine, clear, and sunny, with a soft western breeze. The starting post was about three miles from the castle, but long before the hour the surrounding hills were covered with people, squire and farmer, with no lack of their wives and daughters, many a hind in his smock-frock, and many an operative from the neighbouring factories. 
the gentlemen riders gradually arrived the entries were very numerous though it was understood that not more than a dozen would come to the post and half of these were the guests of lord monmouth at half-past one the cortege from the castle arrived and took up the post which had been prepared for them on the summit of the hill lord monmouth was much cheered on his arrival in the carriage with him were madame colonna and lady st julians the princess lucretia lady gaythorpe mrs guy flouncey accompanied by lord eskdale and other cavaliers formed a brilliant company there was scarcely a domestic in the castle who was not there the comedians indeed did not care to come but villebecq prevailed upon flora to drive with him to the race in a buggy he borrowed of the steward the start was to be at two o'clock the gentlemen jockeys are mustered never were riders mounted and appointed in better style the stewards and the clerk of the course attend them at the starting post there they are now assembled guy flouncey takes up his stirrup leathers a hole mr melton looks at his girths in a few moments the irrevocable monosyllable will be uttered the bugle sounds for them to face about the clerk of the course sings out gentlemen are you all ready no objection made the word given to go and fifteen riders start in excellent style prince colonna who rode like prince rupert took the lead followed closely by a stout yeoman on an old white horse of great provincial celebrity who made steady running and from his appearance and action an awkward customer the rest with two exceptions followed in a cluster at no great distance and in this order they continued with very slight variation for the first two miles though there were several ox fences and one or two of them remarkably stiff indeed they appeared more like horses running over a course than over a country the two exceptions were lord beaumanoir on his horse sunbeam and sidonia on the arab these kept somewhat slightly in the rear almost in this wise they approached the dreaded brook indeed with the exception of the last two riders who were about thirty yards behind it seemed that you might have covered the rest of the field with a sheet they arrived at the brook at the same moment seventeen feet of water between strong sound banks is no holiday work but they charged with unfaltering intrepidity but what a revolution in their spirited order did that instant produce a masked battery of canister and grape could not have achieved more terrible execution coningsby alone clearly lighted on the opposing bank but for the rest of them it seemed for a moment that they were all in the middle of the brook one over another splashing kicking swearing every one trying to get out and keep others in mr melton and the stout yeoman regained their saddles and were soon again in the chase the prince lost his horse and was not alone in his misfortune mr guy flouncey lay on his back with a horse across his diaphragm only his head above water and his mouth full of chickweed and dock leaves and if help had not been at hand he and several others might have remained struggling in their watery bed for a considerable period in the midst of this turmoil the marquis and sidonia at the same moment cleared the brook affairs now became interesting here coningsby took up the running sidonia and the marquis lying close at his quarters mr melton had gone the wrong side of a flag and the stout yeoman though close at hand was already trusting much to his spurs in the extreme discomfort might be detected three or four stragglers thus they continued until within three fields of home a ploughed field finished the old white horse the yeoman struck his spurs to the rowels but the only effect of the experiment was that the horse stood stock still coningsby sidonia and the marquis were now all together the winning post is in sight and a high and strong gate leads to the last field coningsby looking like a winner gallantly dashed forward and sent sir robert at the gate but he had overestimated his horse's powers at this point of the game and a rattling fall was the consequence however horse and rider were both on the right side and coningsby was in his saddle and at work again in a moment it seemed that the marquis was winning there was only one more fence and that the foot people had made a breach in by the side of a gate-post and wide enough as was said for a broad-wheeled wagon to travel by 
Instead of passing straight over this gap, Sunbeam swerved suddenly against the gate and threw his rider. This was decisive. The daughter of the star, who was still going beautifully, pulling double and her jockey sitting still, sprang over the gap and went in first. Coningsby on Sir Robert being placed second. The distance measured was about four miles. There were thirty-nine leaps, and it was done under fifteen minutes. Lord Monmouth was well content with the prowess of his grandson, and his extreme cordiality consoled Coningsby under a defeat which was very vexatious. It was some alleviation that he was beaten by Sidonia. Madame Colonna even shed tears at her young friend's disappointment and mourned it especially for lucretia who had said nothing though a flush might be observed on her usually pale countenance villebecq who had betted was so extremely excited by the whole affair especially during the last three minutes that he quite forgot his quiet companion and when he looked round he found flora fainting you rode well said sidonia to coningsby but your horse was more strong than swift after all this thing is a race and notwithstanding solomon in a race speed must win end of chapter fourteen book four chapter fifteen notwithstanding the fatigues of the morning the evening was passed with great gaiety at the castle the gentlemen all vowed that far from being inconvenienced by their mishaps they felt on the whole rather better for them Mr. Guy Flouncey, indeed, did not seem quite so limber and flexible as usual, and the young guardsman, who had previously discoursed in an almost alarming style of the perils and feats of the Kildare country, had subsided into a remarkable reserve. The provincials were delighted with Sidonia's riding, and even the Leicestershire gentleman admitted that he was a customer. Lord Monmouth beckoned to Coningsby to sit by him on the sofa, and spoke of his approaching university life. He gave his grandson a great deal of good advice, told him to avoid drinking, especially if he ever chanced to play cards, which he hoped he never would, urged the expediency of never borrowing money, and of confining his loans to small sums, and then only to friends of whom he wished to get rid of, most particularly impressed on him never to permit his feelings to be engaged by any woman, Nobody, he assured Coningsby, despised that weakness more than women themselves. Indeed, feeling of any kind did not suit the present age. It was not bon ton, and in some degree always made a man ridiculous. Coningsby was always to have before him the possible catastrophe of becoming ridiculous. It was the test of conduct, Lord Monmouth said. A fear of becoming ridiculous is the best guide in life, and will save a man from all sorts of scrapes. For the rest, Coningsby was to appear at Cambridge as became Lord Monmouth's favourite grandson. His grandfather had opened an account for him with Drummonds, on whom he was to draw for his considerable allowance, and if by any chance he found himself in a scrape, no matter of what kind, he was to be sure to write to his grandfather, who would certainly get him out of it. "'Your departure is sudden,' said the Princess Lucretia, in a low, deep tone to Sidonia, who was sitting by her side, and screened from general observation by the waltzes who whirled by. "'Departures should be sudden.' "'I do not like departures,' said the Princess. "'Nor did the Queen of Sheba when she quitted Solomon. You know what she did?' "'Tell me. She wept very much and let one of the King's birds fly into the garden.' You are freed from your cage, she said, but I am going back to mine. But you never weep, said the princess? Never. And are always free? So are men in the desert. But your life is not a desert. It at least resembles the desert in one respect. It is useless. The only useless life is woman's. Yet there have been heroines, said Sidonia. The Queen of Sheba, said the princess, smiling. A favourite of mine, said Sidonia. And why was she a favourite of yours? rather eagerly inquired Lucretia. Because she thought deeply, talked finely, and moved gracefully. And yet might be a very unfeeling dame at the same time, said the princess. I never thought of that, said Sidonia. 
the heart apparently does not reckon in your philosophy what we call the heart said sidonia is a nervous sensation like shyness which gradually disappears in society it is fervent at the nursery strong in the domestic circle tumultuous at school the affections are the children of ignorance when the horizon of our experience expands and models multiply love and admiration imperceptibly vanish i fear the horizon of your experience has very greatly expanded with your opinions what charm can there be in life the sense of existence so sidonia is off to-morrow monmouth said lord eskdale ha said the marquis i must get him to breakfast with me before he goes the party broke up coningsby who had heard lord eskdale announce sidonia's departure lingered to express his regret and say farewell i cannot sleep said sidonia and i never smoke in europe if you are not stiff with your wounds come to my rooms this invitation was willingly accepted i am going to cambridge in a week said coningsby i was almost in hopes you might have remained as long i also but my letters of this morning demand me if it had not been for our chase i should have quitted immediately the minister cannot pay the interest on the national debt not an unprecedented circumstance and has applied to us i never permit any business of state to be transacted without my personal interposition and so i must go up to town immediately suppose you don't pay it said coningsby smiling if i followed my own impulse i would remain here said sidonia can anything be more absurd than that a nation should apply to an individual to maintain its credit and with its credit its existence as an empire and its comfort as a people and that individual one to whom its laws deny the proudest rights of citizenship the privilege of sitting in its senate and of holding land for though i have been rash enough to buy several estates my own opinion is that by the existing law of england an englishman of hebrew faith cannot possess the soil but surely it would be easy to repeal a law so illiberal oh as for illiberality i have no objection to it if it be an element of power eschew political sentimentalism what i contend is that if you permit men to accumulate property and they use that permission to a great extent power is inseparable from that property and it is in the last degree impolitic to make it the interest of any powerful class to oppose the institutions under which they live the jews for example independently of the capital qualities for citizenship which they possess in their industry temperance and energy and vivacity of mind are a race essentially monarchical deeply religious and shrinking themselves from converts as from a calamity are ever anxious to see the religious systems of the countries in which they live flourish yet since your society has become agitated in england and powerful combinations menace your institutions you find the once loyal hebrew invariably arrayed in the same ranks as the leveller and the latitudinarian and prepared to support the policy which may even endanger his life and property rather than tamely continue under a system which seeks to degrade him the tories lose an important election at a critical moment tis the jews come forward to vote against them the church is alarmed at the scheme of a latitudinarian university and learns with relief that funds are not forthcoming for its establishment a jew immediately advances and endows it yet the jews coningsby are essentially tories toryism indeed is but copied from the mighty prototype which has fashioned europe and every generation they must become more powerful and more dangerous to the society which is hostile to them do you think that the quiet humdrum persecution of a decorous representative of an english university can crush those who have successively baffled the pharaohs nebuchadnezzar rome and the feudal ages the fact is you cannot destroy a pure race of the caucasian organization it is a physiological fact a simple law of nature which has baffled egyptian and assyrian kings 
Roman emperors and Christian inquisitors. No penal laws, no physical tortures can affect that a superior race should be absorbed in an inferior or be destroyed by it. The mixed persecuting races disappear, the pure persecuted race remains. And at this moment, in spite of centuries, of tens of centuries of degradation, the Jewish mind exercises a vast influence on the affairs of Europe. I speak not of their laws, which you still obey, of their literature, with which your minds are saturated, but of the living Hebrew intellect. You never observe a great intellectual movement in Europe in which the Jews do not greatly participate. The first Jesuits were Jews. That mysterious Russian diplomacy, which so alarms Western Europe, is organized and principally carried on by Jews. That mighty revolution which is at this moment preparing in Germany, and which will be in fact the second and greater reformation, and of which so little is as yet known in England, is entirely developing under the auspices of Jews, who almost monopolize the professorial chairs of Germany. Neander, the founder of spiritual Christianity, and who is Regis Professor of Divinity in the University of Berlin, is a Jew. Benari, equally famous, and in the same university, is a Jew. Weil, the Arabic professor of Heidelberg, is a Jew. Years ago, when I was in Palestine, I met a German student who was accumulating materials for the history of Christianity and studying the genius of the place, a modest and learned man. It was Vail, then unknown, since become the first Arabic scholar of the day and the author of the life of Mohammed. But for the German professors of this race, their name is Legion. I think there are more than ten at Berlin alone. I told you just now that I was going up to town tomorrow, because I always made it a rule to interpose when affairs of state were on the carpet. Otherwise, I never interfere. I hear of peace and war in newspapers, but I am never alarmed, except when I am informed that the sovereigns want treasure. Then I know that monarchs is serious. A few years back we were applied to by Russia. Now there has been no friendship between the court of St. Petersburg and my family. It has Dutch connections, which have generally supplied it, and our representations in favour of the Polish Hebrews, a numerous race, but the most suffering and degraded of all the tribes, have not been very agreeable to the Tsar. However, circumstances drew to an approximation between the Romanovs and the Sidonias. I resolved to go myself to St. Petersburg. I had, on my arrival, an interview with the Russian Minister of Finance, Count Kankrin. I beheld the son of a Lithuanian Jew. The loan was connected with the affairs of Spain. I resolved on repairing to Spain from Russia. I travelled without intermission. I had an audience, immediately on my arrival, with the Spanish minister, Senor Mendizabel. I beheld one like myself, the son of a Nuevo Cristiano, a Jew of Aragon. In consequence of what transpired at Madrid, I went straight to Paris to consult the president of the French Council. I beheld the son of a French Jew, a hero, an imperial marshal, and very properly, for who should be military heroes if not those who worship the Lord of Hosts? And is Sou a Hebrew? Yes, and others of the French marshals, and the most famous, Massena, for example. His real name was Manasseh, but to my anecdote. The consequence of our consultations was that some northern power should be applied to in a friendly and mediative capacity. We fixed on Prussia, and the President of the Council made an application to the Prussian minister, who attended a few days after our conference. Count Arnim entered the cabinet, and I beheld a Prussian Jew. So you see, my dear Coningsby, that the world is governed by very different personages from what is imagined by those who are not behind the scenes. You startle and deeply interest me. You must study physiology, my dear child. Pure races of Caucasus may be persecuted, but they cannot be despised, except by the brutal ignorance of some mongrel breed that brandishes faggots and howls extermination, but is itself exterminated without persecution by that irresistible law of nature which is fatal to curs. 
"'But I come also from Caucasus,' said Coningsby. "'Verily, and thank your Creator for such a destiny, and your race is sufficiently pure. You come from the shores of the northern sea, land of the blue eye and the golden hair, and the frank brow. Tis a famous breed, with whom we Arabs have contended long, from whom we have suffered much. But these Goths and Saxons and Normans were doubtless great men.' but so favoured by nature, why has not your race produced great poets, great orators, great writers? Favoured by nature and by nature's God, we produced the lyre of David. We gave you Isaiah and Ezekiel. They are our Elinthians, our Philippics. Favoured by nature we still remain, but in exact proportion as we have been favoured by nature, we have been persecuted by man. After a thousand struggles, after acts of heroic courage that Rome has never equalled, deeds of divine patriotism that Athens and Sparta and Carthage have never excelled, we have endured fifteen hundred years of supernatural slavery, during which every device that can degrade or destroy man has been the destiny that we have sustained and baffled. The Hebrew child has entered adolescence only to learn that he was the pariah of that ungrateful Europe that owes to him the best part of its laws, a fine portion of its literature, all its religion. Great poets require a public. We have been content with the immortal melodies that we sung more than two thousand years ago by the waters of Babylon and wept. They record our triumphs, they solace our affliction. Great orators are the creatures of popular assemblies, we were permitted only by stealth to meet even in our temples as for great writers the catalogue is not blank where are all the schoolmen aquinas himself to maimonides and as for modern philosophy all springs from spinoza but the passionate and creative genius that is the nearest link to divinity and which no human tyranny can destroy though it can divert it that should have stirred the hearts of nations by its inspired sympathy, or governed senates by its burning eloquence, has found a medium for its expression to which, in spite of your prejudices and your evil passions, you have been obliged to bow. The ear, the voice, the fancy teeming with combinations, the imagination fervent with picture and emotion that came from Caucasus and which we have preserved unpolluted, have endowed us with almost the exclusive privilege of music, that science of harmonious sounds which the ancients recognized as most divine and deified in the person of their most beautiful creation. I speak not of the past, though were I to enter into the history of the lords of melody, you would find it the annals of Hebrew genius. But at this moment, even, musical Europe is ours. There is not a company of singers, not an orchestra in a single capital, that is not crowded with our children under the feigned names which they adopt to conciliate the dark aversion which your posterity will some day disclaim with shame and disgust. Almost every great composer, skilled musician, almost every voice that ravishes you with its transporting strains springs from our tribes. The catalogue is too vast to enumerate, too illustrious to dwell for a moment on secondary names, however eminent. Enough for us that the three great creative minds, to whose exquisite inventions all nations at this moment yield, Rossini, Meyerbeer, Mendelssohn, are of Hebrew race, and little do your men of fashion, your muscadins of Paris, and your dandies of London, as they thrill into raptures at the notes of a pasta or a greasy, little do they suspect that they are offering their homage to the sweet singers of Israel. End of chapter 15